good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone signing in for today, today's session uh, at GADMIC. Um, today's presentation is being provided by, as I said earlier today, uh, Dr. Veronica Policarpo from Portugal. And again, she's going to be talking about media effective atmospheres and the construction of vulnerability of animals in disasters. Again, the session has been proudly sponsored by C4 Group. So it's uh, fantastic to have um, Veronica present today all, all the way from uh, Portugal. Uh, remember that all our speakers' uh, bios and abstracts are available from the GADMAC website. Just um, have a look to one of, the, one of the main menus and look under speakers and you'll find the bio and abstract. But just a few points of housekeeping before we start. Um, the Zoom feature uh, has been disabled, um, but there is a Q&A uh, forum posted up there. So at any stage in the conference, please put up your, your questions and we can come back to those um, probably towards the end of the session. We also encourage you to use our social media tags, GADMAC. Conf, which is hashtag G-A-D-M-C-O-N-F uh, for Twitter and other social media. Now, when you finish today's session, there will be a short evaluation, which we ask for you to, to complete. And just a reminder that the video recording is not available until we edit it and re release it approximately July for as part of our GADMAC awards ceremony. So without further ado, it's great to welcome Dr. Policarpo from Portugal to talk today about her topic on media effective atmospheres, the construction of vulnerability of animals in disasters. Over to you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you and good morning or good evening, any, uh, everyone, depending on your location and time zone. And first of all, uh, my first words are for the organizing committee uh, to thank everyone for such an extraordinary work in putting together this conference on such an important topic. So thank you. And thank you also to C4 Group for sponsoring this presentation today. And today I'm here to talk um, about the first exploratory results of an ongoing project about wildfires in Portugal. And I will talk on behalf of the whole team who has been involved in the project for the last year. So my presentation will focus on a specific angle of a wider pro project uh, about how Portuguese media depict animals caught in disasters. We would like to dedicate this work today and today's presentation to all those human and non-human uh, whose lives were either lost or severely impacted by these fires uh, about which I'm going to talk here today. So this research on media coverage is part of a wider project about animals in disasters, in which we try to address this subject in three different countries in, and three different types of disaster, wildfires in Portugal, floods in the UK, and earthquakes in Italy. We, then, we began by the Portuguese case and focused on two case studies, two mega fires that took place in 2017 in the Dragon Grand and Oliveira do Hospital, two uh, regions of Portugal. So case study one is the one we are going to address today. It happened between the 17th and the 24th of June, 2017, and spread over nine municipalities with a total burnt area between 29 acres and 53 acres, depending on the source. The official reports state that the origin was a dry storm, which ignited several aggressive fires with very high convective plumes. These fires developed well above the surface, which explains the rapid spread and aggressive burning. In this picture, we see a screenshot of a video shot from the fireman headquarters of the Dragon Grand. If you look closely, you can see an electrical discharge coming from the convection plume. Mega fires like those in Pedrogo and behave in unexpected ways, going way beyond the suppression means. 
with firefighters being unable to control the fire spread even the, uh, in the most prepared and equipped regions. The death challenge current paradigms of coping with fire based on control, as anthropologist Adriana Petrina puts it. 66 people lost their life in this fire. Of these, at least three died because they went back to try to save their animals. The total amount of non-human lives being far more difficult to assess. The second case study is related to the mega fires that occurred later that same year in October in a region not that far from the previous one, involving around 14 municipalities and a total area of more than 240,000 acres. 51 people at least lost their lives. How many non-human animals lost their lives during these wildfires in 2017? We cannot know for sure. Official data is scarce, only refers to certain species and types of animals, and certainly underestimates not only those species they don't mention, but also those that are mentioned. If we take official data as a reference, over half a million animals lost their lives in these wildfires. And as it is usually the case, confined animals and poultry in particular are amongst the most affected ones. These figures do not include companion animals. In the image on the left, you can see the affected areas right at the center of the country, a region called Pinal Interior and known by its vulnerability to wildfires due to a conjugation of weather conditions such as extreme humidity plus extreme heat in summer seasons and also the type and density of vegetation. The graph on the right shows how incidence of fires is increasingly steadily over the last four decades with abrupt changes in the 2000s, in particular in 2017. The project follows a multi-method approach based on analysis of official documents and legislation on media analysis and mostly on representations and practices of relevant stakeholders in the field, such as the local communities, firemen, civil protection officers, veterinarians, civil society associations, and organisms of local governance. Right now, we are in the exploratory phase and started with media analysis of case study one, the Dragon Grand. That will be our focus today. So research will then proceed to extend media analysis to case study two, which is Oliveira do Hospital, as well as to local papers and to social media. Ethnography and interviews with the local communities, as well as with key stakeholders, will take place as the pandemic context allows. Everything was delayed everywhere. So today we will then focus on the first case study, uh, the one, the wildfires, the mega fires in Pedrogon Grande. We ask a very specific question. How did the media report and construct the situation of non-human animals in disasters? Uh, how were animals depicted in Portuguese press and TV news in this particular case? So uh, adjacent questions are, how was the disaster itself portrayed? How are animals that are caught therein portrayed? And what kind of uh, effective atmospheres do these representations contribute to produce? So this means that in terms of methods, I will be talking mainly about media analysis and in particular, national newspapers and television. We included uh, three newspapers, uh, two daily ones, one um, taken as a reference paper and another one taken as a tabloid and another weekly newspaper and two television broadcasters, a public one and a private one. So all uh, news mentioning the wildfires in Pedrogon Grand were a retreat, so we can uh, uh, have a feeling of the, the prevalence of mentions to, anim uh, to animals. Um, within a time frame that tried to cover the life cycle of the news. And we chose certain um, keywords, animals, animal, cattle, sheep, goats, dog, cat, bees, biodiversity, and other words, so we could identify the news pieces that had to do with animals. So let's start by a simple, very brief, brief uh, description of the sample. Uh, I only chose um, a particular one or two variables that uh, I thought it could be interesting to show you. Um, the vast majority of the corpus is made of news from the press, 
with only 16% being TV news. However, this uh, should not mislead this because even though there are uh, less uh, p uh, pieces of news, they are they, they have they are very important because, as you know, they are longer in size and high in, in impact. Uh, using image, sound, and music to build up and produce uh, emotional effects and effects. Um, without surprise, on the right side you can see a graph that shows how low is the, pre the prevalence of presence of animals uh, in these news. So uh, in only 6% of these uh, news pieces do animals show up. So for the analysis that follows, we will focus exclusively on the 89 news that make uh, a direct or indirect reference to animals. Almost half were news articles, followed by TV lives. Uh, and we also try to capture the centrality given to animals through a variable that measures in each news piece whether that article only makes a small reference or uh, to animals or put them at the core of the piece. So when, um, when the article uh, makes a very small uh, reference, so centrality is lower, we call it uh, low centrality, uh, it can be moderate or it can be high. And expectedly only 12 of these news pieces gave animals high prominence, of which 10 were newspaper articles or short news, which means that it's not that prominent because if you give it a very small space uh, in, in the newspaper and in the page, it, it doesn't um, uh, build up as an important something to, in which we should focus our attention. So animals are therefore, just looking at this very uh, introductory data, highly invisible in the media coverage of the Portuguese megafires. Even though we might think otherwise, uh, while watching the specific news, and I remember watching them uh, back in 2017, uh, because uh, some of the news reported very, high impact uh, situations such as veterinarians or volunteers visiting the, the sites trying to help people and animals. And it seemed that the, the visibility was high, but actually it's low, prominence it's low. So having this broad description of the corpus as a background, let us now try to focus on the themes referring to these 89 selected news items to try to sketch a first qualitative portrait of how animals were depicted in these fires. Drawing on content analysis of these 89 pieces, we propose four portraits of a country on fire, plus three portraits of animals caught therein. The first portrait is quite obvious, actually. It's a portrait of tragedy and of the efforts of all those caught in the fire, either as victims or as rescuers since the first ignitions. In this page of a Portuguese reference newspaper, we see an example of how animals are seldom the core of the news, namely in the first stages of the news cycle, the first hours and days after the beginnings of the fires, when humans, human lives are being more severely impacted. While the title is, also, is all constructed around animals and their tragic condition of being on the verge of star starving, the content of the news piece is actually not about the animals themselves. Rather, animals are used as a metaphor of, or and to draw attention to, the extreme severity and consequences of these fires. News that help to build this portrait are mainly focused on the emergency phase, depicting efforts to control the fire, so the paradigm of control is very present in this news, um, the rescue effort mostly of humans and much less frequently of the animals. There is an emphasis on the night of the tragedy, the deaths of relatives, reports on missing people and missing animals, carbonized sceneries, individuals returning to burned homes in the aftermath, efforts of saving and helping humans or animals. So animals appear as objects of organized help mostly in the aftermath phase usually either because they are lost, lost and searching for their humans, or in the case, and this is the case of companion animals, or because they are in need of food and water, and this is the case of farmed animals. These images also, also depict fire victims being left to themselves, which means that uh, rescue during emergency is mostly in the hands of the owners of the animals, the guardians or of the animals themselves. 
So in this portrait of the fires as tragic, animals are seldom the protagonists. However, when this happens, when they are the protagonists, their prominence is low. In this slide, you can see the page of a Portuguese tabloid dedicated to the fire. So the whole page is dedicated to the fire. So on the top left, it says a hell in flames. It's the, the banner uh, with the, the black banner, hell in flames. So the whole page is dedicated to the fire. And in the right bottom corner, you can see a, a very small, a small short news piece in which most of the area of the news is occupied by the picture of a female dog chains to her doghouse. Title, photo and caption, they all concur to provide a survival story, which interestingly reverts the nexus of causality between the animal's living conditions and their survival to the fire. So while the title reads, female dog survives the fire by hiding inside doghouse, the caption completes this survival story saying that the quote, area where the dog moves did not have vegetation, protecting her from the fire, unquote. So this narrative does makes, us, does makes invisible the deprived conditions of this particular animal and probably of the people that live near her as well, prior to the fires and the relation to, the, to several risk factors that make both humans and animals more vulnerable to hazards. Uh, factors uh, uh, well known such as poverty, poor living conditions, imprisonment, confinement. What seems interesting in this present re representation is it, it is attributing the protection uh, from, the fi uh, from the fire to the risk itself. So the very same social conditions that build vulnerability to risk, namely confinement, being chained to the doghouse, are presented as protective a second portrait evolves around critical views and assessment of the action of the government and political institutions, namely how they fail to address long-term critical conditions that make certain areas more vulnerable to hazards turning into disasters, such as land use patterns or territory planning and management. This article of a reference newspaper tries to quantify the losses, putting them in relation to the previous decade and exemplifies how the alleged lack of political action in the long run results in serious deficiencies in disaster planning and management, which in turn result in catastrophic consequences or events. The focus is either on the preparedness or planning phase or on recovery phase. Animals matter here as another number adding up to major losses, testifying the failure of disaster planning. Post-disaster consequences, such as robbery, scarcity of food, are also referred. Portrait 3, on the other hand, builds, tries to build on hope. It depicts mostly what was going on in terms of help to the victims and civil society organizing itself to provide help and support. It focuses mainly in the post-disaster phase. It also highlights hopeful endeavors from already existing structures such as the municipal kennels and veterinarians. It depicts the action of associations of volunteers for the protection of animals. Emphasis is on direct support, bringing food and medicines, for instance. However, we may ask, to which point does it conceal how the civil society initiatives emerge actually from a lack of other sources of institutional support, from the difficulties of the system to respond and support its citizens. Portrait 3, emotional focus, is, contrary to the previous two portraits, is positive. Through narrating resilience to tragedy, it tries to release the emotional tension built up in the first stages of the fires and in the other two previous portraits. Finally, portrait 4 is the only one in which the animals gain higher prominence, being put at the core of heroic narratives. This is mainly done through short news versus long articles or reports, which show a, a higher prominence, and exclusively focused on companion animals. It is the case of this tabloid short news about a, a quote, female dog barks nonstop and saves family and neighbors, end quote 
With a highly charged emotional tone, this portrait draws on a very classical, heroic, or dramatic narrative based on the self-sacrificing animal. Human feelings are attributed to the animal, producing an anthropomorphization that brings humans and animals closer. These pieces perform a specific role within the structure of the wider narrative across different pieces and uh, as the news life cycle unfolds, uh, a role of emotional release or escape. He joins portrait one in producing a, a, a positive tone of hope, portrait three, I'm sorry, uh, in producing a positive tone of hope in its emotional focus. Why then do we call them alibi heroes? Because in the end, in our opinion, these portraits contribute to make even more invisible the conditions of all animals hardly hit by these catastrophes, farmed and confined animals, namely being the most affected of all. So does this representation of animals as heroes mean that animals are gaining space in the media coverage of the disasters? Can we say, following authors like Margot de Mello, for instance, that these stories help to humanize animals and that this contributes to make them more worry about our consideration? Or rather, does this kind of depiction lead to make them invisible by reproducing the same milestones in the social narrative around human interest and human exceptionalism? So narratives covering topics such as poverty, exclusion, solidarity among the most deprived, social cohesion and its lack thereof, gender differences, for instance, uh, often the dog hero is a female dog. Why is that? Um, why are these gender nurturing stereotypes always being brought up? Narratives in which animals perform very specific functions following a purpose uh, going through obstacles and finally reaching a resolution, a solution, and all converge towards human interest in the end. So we have then three portraits of the animal, of the animals. This is how we get there. So animals are firstly depicted mainly as economic losses in the case of farmed animals, uh, mainly sheep, cattle, and horses. Poultry, however, are highly invisible. Animals are also portrayed as victims. This applies to companion animals and to animals raised in small scale farms with whom farmers develop a personal relationship. Sometimes wild animals also get into the picture. Animals are depicted as we've just seen as heroes. So, and yet animals are seldom the protagonists of these stories. And when they are, their heroic action is depicted as a metaphor for human tragedy and only companion animals get to be heroes, therefore reinforcing the, invis the invisibility of other species uh, or reducing them to economic roles. So it is in this sense that we propose to use Carol Adams' expression that animals are absent reference. They are like torn out into their constitutive parts, even if metaphorically, apart from their living conditions that make them vulnerable, namely confinement, and can then be consumed as a media product uh, as proper separate parts of the tragedy of the disaster, without the readers having the perception to whom those parts or fragments of life belong, without getting to know them as full subjects. They are at the same time participants and absent elements in this process of storytelling empowered and disempowered, absent from these discursive practices in which their story is being remade. And this covers how the human dominion over these other species. So they are used in our opinion as critical elements to reinforce a humanistic and human-centered framework of dealing with disasters, which is reenacted through these media narratives. While ha hazards and disasters highlight the shared vulnerability of humans, and other animals, and the need to go beyond the human-animal divide to address them, these portraits kind of go backwards. They reinforce an ideological framework that lies at the roots of the exploitative model that characterizes the way we humans tend to relate to nature and it indeed at the roots of many hazards. Finally, and just to conclude, 
It is in this sense that we propose to speak of these media portraits as conjuring up to build specific effective atmospheres around disasters, in this particular case, of course, wildfires. So effective of atmospheres are effective qualities that emanate from the assembling uh, of bodies, uh, which in the emergency phase and in the face of extreme circumstances are lived as very dramatic and face to face, but which uh, are then built and rebuilt over these media uh, narratives uh, and languages. And uh, these narratives in, uh, are in such a way um, uh, that they, they produce a, a certain portrait of the animals, which is highly, um, uh, which highly, in our opinion, reinforces uh, human um, uh, except, exceptionalism. So uh, in this sense, these effective qualities uh, exceed the assembling of the bodies. Uh, they are unstable, they are changing all the time, and then we need to attend to their instability and their ambiguities to understand them. And most of all, we must attend to how this is weaved into a major ideological anthropocentric framework uh, that conceals the real animals and their interests. And this includes, obviously, the general uh, invisibility um, uh, in the news of the infrastructural conditions that repeatedly turn the same regions of the country prone to wildfires and repeatedly turn the same animals more prone to being victims of these disasters. And um, I would conclude here uh, saying thank you for listening and for giving us this opportunity to share with you all our exploratory results. Thank you. Thanks, Veronica. That was really insightful. There's a few things that, um, that, that resonated with me. I'm just going to, before I talk about those, I'm sure we've got a few questions from the floor, and one of them is from uh, Jennifer, and she'd like to know, did the study identify media of different cultures applying different portraits to animals across disasters in different countries? Uh, shall I answer one yeah, by one, please. or do you want to collect a yeah, few? Yeah, you, you can uh, answer okay. as you wish. Okay. Uh, now this particular study, uh, we focused exclusively on the Portuguese press, so no, for this particular study. But we do have ongoing another study, which is working on hurricanes. So we are comparing um, international media. Uh, but what we, uh, we we still don't have results. But from our first approach, we would say that uh, there is a very westernized uh, definition of the, the disaster. So when we look at the news that come out uh, about a hurricane that goes, it's in, it's in the Bahamas, for instance, the prominence is very different uh, uh, that um, uh, compared to when that happened in Mozambique, in Africa, for instance, like Idai. So, but I still don't have results on that. But thank you for the question. Very interesting and very important. Comparing culture is very important. Shall I, so, Stephen, shall I stop to share my screen now or should um, I? You can either stop the screen and go, uh, yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, so look, with all the what you've learned through that uh, that analysis of the different sort of media framing of animals and disasters, what do you think are some of the strategies for for people like us that are advocating for improved animal disaster arrangement? What can we learn from your your research that can help us maybe uh, can I say exploit the media to um, amplify the message that we want to convey? Very, very important question. Um, I think the first, and I, actually, I, as I was preparing yesterday a presentation, I was asking myself that question. So how can we use this to, to better, to improve our communication about disasters? And I think that the, the, I would start by this deep understanding that media and journalists, they do work uh, within a frame. So they're professionals like we are and they are working to, uh, in an industry that sells news. So we, they will work uh, within uh, certain rules. So if we can understand the rules that 
and the first rule, what is new? So they have to work with something that brings the attention of the public that people want to know about and they have to inform. Um, and so I think the first thing for us is to uh, know uh, the, how the news life cycle evolves and folds, and folds. And to understand the, pro, the, the way emotion, for instance, is used, and uh, namely in television, but not, all, not only as it's just seen. Um, and so we can try to work with the journalists as partners and to the media communicators in general as partners. Um, uh, so we can, um, for instance, not, ex not focus the media coverage of disasters exclusively on when disasters occur, but also when they are not occurring, trying to understand the deep causes that may lead to disasters. Because when, when there's a disaster, the emotional part will come to the surface and the journalist and the media will have to focus on the emotional part and we can work with them also on that. So how to try to still convey a deep and complex uh, portrait of the situation, still tackling the emotional dimension of the, of the problem. But the complexity, the complexity of the causes, uh, we can try to work with the, with the media and with journalists in order to, when the disasters are not occurring, uh, we can, make, for instance, long, uh, longer pieces, uh, uh, interviews, uh, research uh, journalism, investigate, uh, so journalists can investigate the causes. So work outside the, um, the, the drama, the disaster itself, before it happens in the long, in the long run. Um, so I, I, I think, and also have this, have this knowledge of the rules of the game. So when you're working to, in the media industry, there are rules like in the academia or any other profession. And, and what are those rules? And how can we work with them in order to make those rules sustainable for all parts and to, to be able to convey our own messages in, in, in a more complex way, so not not giving, not giving up to the, to the easy, easy and difficult at the same time part of breaking down to emotional uh, despair, for instance. And we found that there are so many different emergencies where uh, animals become the artifact of, of the event in the, in the sense of, if we think of Hurricane Katrina, there was the there was the photo or video of the little white dog snowball being taken away from the child because he couldn't take it on the bus. And in New Zealand, we had a, um, an earthquake and there were three cows that were left on a little landslip um, area and that became the focus of news. In the bushfires in Australia, we've had um, you know, situations where the fireman is, is giving a bottle of water to a, to a koala bear. And sometimes these, these are the images that typify um, a disaster. People may not be able to think of a certain person, but they often remember a story about animals. So this goes back to a point that, um, that Mal was um, asking, was to what extent do you think animals were used to sell the story in, in, in these? And in, in Australia, she said that uh, we've found many stories where animals is featured in a photo or a headline, but then the content itself doesn't really cover animals much at all. Exactly. That is a very, very important point. Thank you for bringing it up, Stephen and Mel, because um, it actually... Uh, and, and we, uh, I think one of the examples I showed talked about it. So the, the, they used the animals to catch attention, but the, the news itself had nothing to do with animals. So animals were just adding up to the numbers. And in my opinion, animals are used to sell everything, not only disasters and news, but everything. So that's part of the wider process of commodification. So we turn, we objectify them. This is really rooted in the anthropocentric framework that cut crosses everything uh, and our relation with the non-human in general and with animals in particular. 
So um, we, up, we make them objects either to, to read or to consume as news, but it's, it's not that it, we eat animals either, I don't eat, but you know what I mean. So we eat animals either as food or as news is the kind of nutriment for the human. So we mm -hmm. make them objects, then they are commodities, and we buy them and uh, certainly in the wildfires in, in Australia, animals were uh, depicted. There's um, an Italian um, uh, author uh, that talked about, uh, Antonio Gramsci, he talked about a, a concept that uh, I really it's, I find useful to understand this process for me, which is ideological incorporation. So what this means is that the disruptive potential of something, the potential to fight the status quo of something is incorporated by the dominant structure. And when that happens, it, uh, the dominant structure devoids the disrupt, disruptive potential of, uh, of that uh, action. Or, so when we are bringing in animals in that way, I think we are breaking their potential for, uh, to, to emancipate of emancipation of this framework that uh, which is very anthropocentric so that's a risk uh, that we also uh, um, uh, have to be aware of we as animal uh, people that care about animals and that study animals and uh, what is the tipping point uh, at which uh, if we talk so much about animals we begin to uh, also commodify them um, and that's a risk we, we, we have always to be aware of and of course to not to let to happen but <laughs> not easy because it's everything the, the framework is very anthropocentric. Absolutely and look if anyone else has got other questions we're happy to, to take those one or two more. Um, where do you see the, the, the gaps in terms of the, the the media and animal disaster management. Where do you think the main sort of research gaps are? The gaps between the media and research and management. And um, not yeah, sure. Is there, is there uh, in, in terms of studies around the use of um, media? I'm sorry, my cat and... is. <laughs> I'm so sorry. My cat decided to come to on top of. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was bound to happen. It, it could have been could have been a large. Saint I'm glad Bernard. I have um, this, this wallpaper, otherwise it would be even worse. Um, I mean, in terms of in, in terms of what you've done in terms of research, um, how often has the role of the media been researched in in, in the context of the media being involved in animal emergencies? Uh, uh, the, um, from, from my experience in this exploratory project, the media are, um, are just are really focused in the emergency phase because that's where the news uh, items, so the, the criteria of what be, when an event becomes news for journalists and for communication uh, professionals, that's really, the, it gains a, a, a lot of prominence because there are many deaths, all the, the so it's mainly on the, on the emergency phase. The recovery phase sometimes gains, gets some attention. In the, it has to do with the news life cycle. Uh, for instance, when, when it's the anniversary of the fires, it will gain a little bit of attention, but as the years go by, that attention fades away. Uh, and there's something that gains a lot of attention, so the, the, it's very unstable and it changes over time. And at some point, attention switches to, for instance, the political election. So when there's a scandal, for instance, about funding to recovery, to the uh, funding that the government or the European Union uh, allocated to the recovery phase, and there's a, a scandal about corruption on the distribution of, of that funding, then the media will also focus their attention. So you see that it's not on the whole life cycle of the disaster, it's on the life cycle of the news. So it's two different logics. Sometimes they overlap and they meet, uh, and mostly they meet in the emergency phase from my point of view. So we could work with journalists to improve the, the, um, 
the, the presence of the media across different uh, phases of the disaster, disaster cycle management, I think. Brilliant. I'll just check in to see if Mel has any other sort of uh, questions or, or comments. Um, but look, I, I think it's been a fantastic presentation. Um, and you also should get an award because you are the, the first presenter to successfully deploy the virtual background um, of GADMAT. So we are very <laughs> excited about that. And you know, the other observation um, from that presentation is often we, we talk about how we, we make animals more vulnerable through our actions and that confinement, the dog that was chained up. Because if we look at like areas that are flood prone, that's one of the reasons which that confinement, that tethering creates more vulnerability and we want to reduce it. But we've actually got a situation in this case that the chained dog, because that chain is destroying or, or taking away all the vegetation, um, it's actually removed the fire hazard. And it's not often that we have a, a, a counterpoint. Um, I'm not saying it's okay for animal welfare, but it shows that you know, there are other, sometimes how we view a vulnerability can actually be something that can actually not just reduce it, um, but actually increase it and vice versa. So, you know, dog, dog chaining, for example, increases vulnerability in uh, flooding, but in this case, it decreased the vulnerability because of the, um, the removal of vegetation. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting um, construct. So, um, mm. Yes, but, but my point was precisely that that's what the news is selling mm. because the, the news criteria is uh, criterion is the exceptionalism. So uh, what be, uh, an event becomes one of the, the criteria that, that, that is used is whenever an event is so exceptional, like the dog that bites the, the man, uh, the, the man that bites the dog instead of the, the, the dog that bites the man. So that the exceptionality of the event makes it uh, to become news. And my point was precisely that in, uh, do, in doing that, we are actually concealing the higher vulnerability of all animals that are chained because they can't get away. So that was really an exception. So uh, probably many, many dogs died because they were cha chained and they are not being uh, reported on. So my but point was that that we have to be aware because when they tell the story like, People will, uh, to begin with, we, we will, they will, it's almost like they're uh, making legitimate to having dogs chained because in the end they will be, uh, they, they can even get away from, from this horrific mega fire. But it was luck. It was it, it, how many dogs died because they were actually chained mm -hmm. and the, the fact that the chain took away the, the vegetation, didn't save them at all. So um, I think that, so thank you for bringing up that point because mm -hmm. it's, um, it's uh, uh, very important because it works with this exception and the exception, what it does is that it conceals the infrastructural, which is quite kind of boring. Everything that is infrastructural, routes, uh, long term, it's boring. So it's not that, uh, interesting and, it, and it can normalize, as you say, it can normalize some of those behaviors um, that place animals in, in, you know, you know, in more vulnerable situations. And I suppose, you know, my observations in more in human responses is that it's overly common, too common, that we see photos and video footage of children playing in flood water. Um, as if it were some sort of water water game or water park, but obviously that's not the messaging we want the media to actually show. It reinforces it and, and legitimizes, you know, um, unwanted behavior. Um, so totally, totally agree. And, and this is one of the great things about GADMAC is that we get to have these conversations and we, we get to see the different viewpoints and how we can frame and reframe some of the concepts. And so that's why it's been a great pleasure to, to have you uh, present today, um, Veronica. Um, you'll you. get a second award for the, um, the cat bomb 
Uh, that was well. That was well played because that's that, that's exceptionalism. So I'm sure that will go viral at some stage. Um, mm -hmm. But um, great to have you here, and thank you thank everyone you. for being part of tonight's presentation. And um, we certainly look forward to seeing how your research progresses in that fantastic space. So thanks thank everyone. You. That's our last presentation for for today. So good morning, good afternoon, good, morning. And good night. And I wish you thank all you, very Stephen. well. And thank you all. Thanks, thank Monica. You. Our pleasure. It's a pleasure. Right. Goodbye, everyone.